to make things that make things better, have fun doing it, and learn to help yourself and everyone around you flourish? Well, you've come to the right place. Welcome to Enliven. This is the show where we explore what's possible and the people, the principles, and the practices that are going to help you build enlivening products and enlivening organizations. Welcome back, dear listener. I'm your host, Andrew Scottsko, and my guest in this episode is Derek Mills. Derek is the founder and CEO of Glow, a health and wellness company that challenges people to live a fulfilling life and actually live into their potential. Glow is a bootstrapped, self-funded company whose online service empowers members around the world to experience world-class instruction in yoga, meditation, and philosophy, and to integrate self-care into their everyday lives from anywhere in the world. Featured in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Forbes, Goop, Oprah, and more, Glow has gone on to become a cultural phenomenon driven by Derek's commitment to creating an environment that enables people to live into their potential and to contribute to something larger than themselves. Now, one of the things that I most admire about Derek and which I think really comes through in this conversation is his authenticity and vulnerability. Derek has led the creation of a very successful company as an example of how to transform one's environment and company by transforming oneself. He's doing it in a way that I find authentic, inspiring, and relatable. Among many other things, we discuss how to be okay with things being a never-ending work in progress, how to let go of shame, how to let go of perfectionism, and how to engage well in the struggles of life and business. We discuss many powerful experiences in Derek's entrepreneurial journey in this conversation, as well as the almost decade that Derek spent traveling and experiencing the fullness of humanity around the world before getting into entrepreneurship. Now, I'm especially excited about this conversation because Derek and Glow's story are a real-world, ongoing case study of how to make real many of the essential concepts that are being discussed on this show. Entrepreneurship, how do you create a culture that is kind and candid and creates high performance? This episode is coming out in April of 2020 during the global COVID-19 pandemic, the COVID quarantines as I've taken to calling them. And I actually wanted to uh, give a special shout out to Derek and to the entire company of Glow and the app uh, in particular. They did not request this shout out. This is in no way incentivized. I have to say this app has made such a difference in the daily, my daily quality of life, like my mental and emotional health and well-being during this time of self-quarantine, being able to just like pull out my phone or my iPad and or, or just go online and do some yoga from home and actually feel like I'm out of yoga class has made such a difference to uh, to my day to day routine, even if it's like for 10 minutes in the morning. So um If you like what you hear about that or in this conversation with Derek, I highly encourage you to check it out. Again, uh, no, they did not request me to do this or anything like that. I'm just a big, big fan of it, uh, of Derek and the company and the app. So I hope you'll check it out. Okay. with that being said, this is a very raw, very real story from the front lines of exploring what business is and what business can be. And I am honored to bring it to you. Please enjoy this conversation with Derek Mills. Derek, my friend, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. I really appreciate it. Great to see you, Andrew. Great to be with you. And thank you for having me on. Oh, absolutely, man. I've I've been, I woke up so excited today because we were having this conversation. So it's already made my day. And so I'm excited to, uh, to actually get into it with you. Awesome. Yeah. I tried to block out as much as possible this day just to get myself as focused as possible. But as I mentioned, I just came off a call that was quite triggering. So I'm, I'm, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know what though? I love that you're like open and honest about that, which is, you know, major thing. Like you and I, you know, gotten to know each other over the last few months. And that's been something that stood out to me about you from, I think maybe the first conversation we ever had, I was like, damn, this dude is like super real. <laughs> and I, I love that about you. I think it's great. Oh, thank you. But you know, so are you. So I feel comfortable to go there with you. It takes two to dance. I was just going to say it takes two to tango. So there we go. You know, where I actually wanted to start um, as I was getting ready for this conversation and, and um, thinking on some of our previous conversations and, and researching you a little bit, I there's something I heard you talk about elsewhere that I think is maybe where this whole thing starts. Um, and it, it's in a college philosophy class that you had. And there was a, a question that your teacher asked everyone to answer, which was, what do you want to get out of this one shot you've got at life? And you had a answer that I thought was beautiful. And I was hoping we, you could tell us what that answer was and, and expand on that a little bit. Like, what did that mean to you? Yeah. Wow. I get goosebumps just thinking about it. What a great question. All right. Well, before I give the answer, uh, I'll just give a slight bit of background. So I, I went to a small liberal arts university up north in Washington state. And uh, my thoughts go out to everyone up there, by the way, for the virus and, and anywhere else. I, th- this was a, this was a lovely place and I had, I had lovely friends and I was a chemistry major, uh, psychedelic mushrooms actually grew on our campus. 
believe it or not. <laughs> so, you know, I was in this space of, of just exploring consciousness, mindfulness, self-awareness. And in my senior year, I took this course that was actually called Hinduism. And we read parts of the Rig Veda, various Upanishads. Uh, we spent a half a semester just in the Bhagavad Gita and, and some other supplemental texts. And I was just blown away by the way in, in which it was taught. It was taught from a very academic point of view, not in any way proselytizing a particular agenda. Like there wasn't a particularly, say, Buddhist or Hindu take on, on the material, which can often, often happen. It's quite common. Uh, or, or other perspectives. And the way it was presented was you know, that, that yoga really is this kind of continuous ongoing process of, of virtuosity and being oneself. And at the end of the semester, on the last day of class, the professor started the class with the one question of what do you want? Like, what do you want in this lifetime? And we all wrote, in our notebook. And my answer was something like, something like I want to nurture and cultivate my capacity for wonder. Something like that. I don't know. Do you have the exact words? What, what I heard you say, yeah, what I heard you say was that you wanted to maintain and cultivate your faculty for faculty, wonder. Faculty. Yes, exactly. And the reason why I gave you the kind of preamble is because wonder has a lot to do with it. Like, like, there's so much opportunity for wonder and awe and gratitude. And you know, even with the chemistry, you know, seeing what this subatomic world looks like and the distinction between the Newtonian world and the uh, quantum world and just playing with all of that and with some of these concepts in, in these texts that are you know, considering how we experience how we speak about reality either from a dual point of view or a non-dual point of view or a combination thereof like all of that was just so fascinating to me and i didn't know what to do with that like i didn't know what I, like what did this mean for me in my life <laughs> yeah uh you know had i been maybe a little more focused a little more precocious a little more intelligent you know perhaps i would have stayed in an academic path but that just set me on on a path of wandering for a number of years. Yeah, I think you mentioned you spent like seven years on the road. Spent, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, so on the road can mean lots of different things to different people. I, true, so yeah, very I true. Worked, I, my first job was in Munich, Germany. Saved some money, traveled through India, uh, through Southeast Asia. Uh, ended up in, in Sydney. I wanted to find a way to stay in Sydney. So I stayed on a student visa. I started uh, the coursework for a master's in neuropsychology at the University of New South Wales. And then uh, through some very specific experiences, which could take us down a really long tangent, I got fascinated with business. And so I switched to the master's in, in business at the University of Sydney. Yeah. What was that? What was that pivot for you? Like why, why the hard left? Because neuros neuropsychology is fascinating. So what was it that took you in this other direction? So I, I began to see that the, the, uh, the profession that would most interest me would require possibly going to medical school, going down the path of either neurology of, of some sort. Uh, you know, neuroscience wasn't what it is today. Mm -hmm. uh, the people that I'd met that were doing work in neuroscience didn't really inspire me. I, uh, you know, I, I look at people who did go down that route back then and the work that they've done and what they've become. And, and I, I, I'd be lying if I said I didn't have some regret and jealousy hmm. about that because it definitely lights up something within me. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I look at all the paths that I took and peeked into, and I'm, I'm going to get to the answer to your question in a minute. And I, <clears throat> I think one, like the threshold to determine whether or not I would continue in any particular path was this kind of intuitive, visceral felt sense of like, how much does it really light me up? And so nothing really lit me up enough to say like, I'm going to devote my life to this. 
you know, even, even just the traveling and the wandering and, and, and being with people in these countries and just sitting with them and staying with them, like that lit me up too. But, you know, I, I, do I become a social worker? Do I start a nonprofit? But like, all of these things were interesting and fascinating to me and tapped into aspects of me that were wanting to be exercised, but just, you know, my mid twenties, late twenties, it just wasn't, clear to me how I could bring together all these different dimensions of myself. And so, yeah, in that, in that first year of neuropsychology, I began to see that the theory is way more interesting than, than the practice and the people doing the really cool work were the ones who got to play with the fMRIs and pet scan technology and, and some other yep. technologies. And, um, you know, it's, it's funny, actually in undergrad, I, I, I wrote to, uh, Robert Sapolsky's lab because I'd read his, I read his book, you know, why zebras don't get ulcers. I think when I was a sophomore or junior, I, I can't remember exactly. And I've read uh, that one yet. I've read, I just read behave, but I haven't read the zebras book yet. Yeah. I haven't read anything of him of his since then. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a block there, but I, uh, I, I plan, I, I'm These sending are also like 600 pages long. So there's, there's not just that. I mean, you could work out with this book. It's huge. <laughs> yeah. I'm not surprised anyway. Um, and, and other attempts like that to kind of crack into that, that world. And, uh, you know, I was, I was a B student and, uh, you know, maybe there, there's some, you know, certainly aspects of, of like feelings of inadequacy and not, not good enough. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I, I still had this fire to go out and explore and come back to this, this sense of wonder and what does wonder and, and awe mean for me? And, and what does it mean for me in, in not only in terms of my own sense of self, sense of self-construct, but what does it mean in terms of how I can contribute to the world in a way that's like fully just resonant with me, authentic to me, uh, and, and, and of service. And so, yeah, so I, I was probably halfway through or in the first semester of, of the neuropsych work. And it was awesome because one of the classes was, uh, with the med students for, for neuroanatomy. And I loved learning about the brain. Mm -hmm. But I was um, dating a, a girl at the time whose father uh, was quite successful in, in business in Sydney. And he'd come back from a, a trip overseas with this collapsible crate. It's kind of like two feet by a foot by a foot. And the sides collapsed in and it collapsed down. And he said, uh, you know, everyone in Italy is using this and um, it doesn't exist in Australia. And the reason why my tone just changes because he has this really tall, large man from Argentina with a very thick, thick accent. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you know, use my, my company, my resources, um, everything. Uh, if you want to bring this into the country and we'll split the profits 50, 50. And so I said, sure. But leading up to that, I was so, you know, my parents were both teachers, so I didn't have, I, I had some experiences with business, uh, in, in childhood and adolescence, but, uh, definitely the, the, the the core, the core environment growing up was about education, not overtly like full on, like it's all about education, but mm -hmm. it was just something that was constantly there. You know, it, it, like for example, my father taught counseling psychology. So, uh, you know, having like Carl Rogers lying around the house and <laughs> peeking in, peeking in and exploring like what, what, what is humanism? What is humanistic psychology? Like, so these things were already kind of percolating in the, in the background for me. Yeah, these seeds have been planted. Exactly. And so uh, I, I was curious about his world. He would take me on meetings and I would see him do his thing. And I would see how he would merge deals with gifts to the city. For example, like connecting a development with a theater or adding a park or you know, et cetera. And I just saw, I saw an interesting combination of, of creating, moving things forward, working with people, negotiating and innovating. And I just, I, it, it, lit, it lit me up yeah. to, to continue with the, the imagery. It lit me up. And uh, sure enough, I ended up, long story short, bringing this product and some other products in from Italy and distributing it all across Australia to um, uh, one of their large department stores, kind of like our Macy's. Uh, I used that money to uh, basically pay for my education. And then uh, that experience and some other experiences inspired me to switch to the master's in business at the University of Sydney. How cool. 
How cool. I love that because one of the, I mean, one of the things you, um, that I actually, the thing that you said in there that jumped out to me that I think is a real through line here from starting back in Australia, but then even now into glow. And we're going to talk a lot more about that, you know, in a little bit is this idea, you know, you talked about your parents being teachers and teaching one way of looking at teaching and education in general is as if not the a primary mechanism by which we help people explore and unlock their potential. And there's, there's a, a phrase I've heard you use that I really love, which is the idea of living into one's potential. Mm. And that seems like mm. that, I, that that's a really core idea for you throughout your life. But of course in glow as well. And I'm curious if, if uh, you could, you know, what does that mean to you? Yeah. So you're, you're, you're picking up on our, so we, we had a, a working version of our mission and vision statements that we've, we've since refined. Uh, we haven't, we haven't publicly posted it yet on, on our, on our platform. I, I've updated it on my, some of my profiles. Uh, but the, the full manifestation of our, our current why statement uh, isn't there. And so maybe we could talk about that in a bit, yeah, but please. Yeah, even, even as we were working with those words to live into, there was some discussion around how it's a little grammatically awkward, but hmm. it was, it was incredibly important to me for us to preserve th- those words because it, it suggests uh, a never complete. It suggests uh, it's it's a living, breathing thing mm-hmm. that uh, there, there's always more. Yeah, no. That that the reason I, I re- it really resonated with me is because I have I'm I'm in love with that idea as well. The idea of potential, and one of the things that occurred to me at some point was that by definition, you never reach your pe- your potential, right? Because there's always more. And for, living versus lived or fulfilled or exactly right. right. Or like, you know, um, people will say things like, you know, to, to, to fully realize our potential. It's like, well, that's actually impossible. Well, you, you, cause as soon as you get somewhere, there's, you know, <laughs> the, the goal line just moved on you. And for a while that really like that made me so feel, it feels so depressed. And then, but you, I think the language you have there of like living into your potential is in some way like the third door. It's like the, the hack on that, um, seeming paradox of like, wait, I have this potential, but I can't get there. So now what? And I, that's why I love the language you've chosen so much. It seems to hit on a um, hit on both the truth of it, but also in a way that is psychologically um, empowering, so to speak. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that, that taps into your, your middle way or your third option philosophy. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're gonna have to remind me what that is because it sounds like something that came up in one of our one of our epic jam sessions that I've I've forgotten about. So for the listener who doesn't know this, so so Derek and I have have developed a pattern over the last few months that I think at least certainly I enjoy. I think he does too. I do. Um, of of basically we'll start somewhere and then we'll have this like three hour jam sesh about God knows what. And at the end of it, I'm not totally sure what we talked about, but my life is better somehow, and, and it's all good. And so somehow it's like it's gotten better. And I think that's what we're gonna have today. Maybe not three hours, but if it is, we'll cut it into parts. You know, we're gonna we're gonna see how this thing goes so that's fun yeah. so you're gonna have to remind me what that third way thing is at some point here totally totally well unfortunately i'll probably be a little less experimental on this given that that this will be publicly available but well we can always cut so fair enough yeah. <laughs> fair enough fair enough but um you know there's actually one other thing that i is related to this and then i want to start to shift gears and talk more about glow and, and some of your journey there but i heard you also say um in another conversation that it was really important to you to learn how to struggle better and I was curious if you could say more about that. Like, what does that mean to you? And, and for that matter, the way you said that assumes that it has to be a struggle. And I'm curious what you think about the idea of does it have to be a struggle? I think it's all in the framing. Yeah, the words that, that I, I use are to struggle well. Like Better suggests, well, just simply suggests that what is happening now is not okay. So in my struggle, if I think of my struggle now as not okay, that I could be struggling better, mm. then that kind of invalidates the ability for my struggle that I'm in within now to be enough and adequate. Mm. Yeah. Versus struggling well aligns me more with, uh, say, like in meditation, the the incessant, per, the assess, the incessant bubbling up of thoughts and simply just observing those thoughts without attachment and judgment, versus. Oh, if I were just only better at this, like, <laughs> I wouldn't have these thoughts. <laughs> if I was just a better meditator, my mind would yeah. shut up. I suck. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so, yeah, I like, I like every meditator ever. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so I, I, like the, I like the concept of struggling well because it, it takes some of the pressure off. And it also suggests that struggle doesn't have to be a bad thing. Struggle doesn't have to be viewed as, as heavy and, and intense. It, you know, I, we all struggle all the time. 
show me one person who probably doesn't experience some type of struggle in their day. Someone saying something to them in a particular way that might engender a particular emotion and that moment of deciding, observing the different options before responding. Mm. Sometimes we're not going to respond in ways that we're proud of. That's a struggle. And so we, that's an experience in and of itself. And that pre thought or that even that thinking moment of, of how will I respond? It is a form of struggle. It, it's, it's the water's turning. It's, 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 it's wrestling with, it's engaging with all different aspects of myself to evaluate, like, how am I going to navigate this particular moment in time? And Maybe struggle is not the right word for, for all of it, but there, there's some, maybe it's to engage well. Hmm. Yeah. So whether we use the word struggle or the word engage, I agree with you that this is something that is inevitable, right? Whatever word you want to say, um, the ability or the, not the ability, um, the requirement to show up and deal with or engage whatever is presenting itself in front of you, you know, that is, that seems to be a requirement of this game we're playing. And yeah. so my, my question is, regardless of the words, whether it's struggle well, engage well, what does that look like for you? What does it mean to you like to show up and do that well? Well, let me just say, sometimes hitting the couch and binging Netflix is fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Altered Carbon season two just came out. <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> this guy's been on that. I've been saving that one. <laughs> that and Formula One, my friend. The season of that just oh, came out too. I know. So I, fucking good. When I finished season one, I was thinking, crap, I have to wait a whole year for another season. Exactly. To come out. It's so good. So good. I had no oh. idea. I had no idea that I would be interested in that. Someone, right? Yeah, a friend keyed me into it. And I thought, nah. And he kept telling me, you got to watch this. You got to watch this. And eventually I did. Oh, I was hooked. Yeah. I was like, wait, for it, like, I was like, ah, racing is kind of boring, whatever. And then I watched it and I was like, oh my God, what the hell have I been doing? Yeah. Yeah. My wife, my wife was chuckling because in the weeks after, I kept checking the leaderboard. Mm hmm. You know, because yeah, exactly. like, I didn't know who these people were. And but then you're know, like 5 a.m. Saturday, Saturday morning getting up to watch a race. And she's like, what yeah. are you doing? And I'm not, I'm not a sports watching guy. I'm a sports, I play sports, but I, yeah. I only watch the Tour de France and the, and the, the World Cup every four yep. years. Yep. Um, and the Super Bowl. Yep. Uh, but I think your question was, what is, what is engaging well look like for me? I'm very curious about what it means to show up with, as your whole self to, to, work, to work. And I, I, I so deeply love that this is now a thing that everyone's talking about. Yes. <laughs> and, I, and I suspect you'll hear an, a, a pretty broad spectrum of what people mean by that. And, and I, I don't claim to have fully, fully, uh, yeah, I haven't spoken about this yet publicly. So I, I, what I'm about to say may, may change, but you know, we, we've, we've identified three core values that, uh, along with all of, the other ways in which we support those values uh, such that we think that leads to creating an environment that's psychologically safe where people can bring their whole selves to work. You know. Well, Glow, Glow was the original leader in the space of bringing yoga, mindfulness, philosophical practices in that, um, in that discipline to people anywhere, right? And so actually having people have access to that, that seems like a really commonplace thing now. People are like, oh yeah, of course you can have an app that lets you do yoga, whatever. But that was that was like groundbreaking when you started. You know, you started in August 2008, like almost uh, you know, 12 years ago. And yeah. uh, you've you've been at the forefront of this thing that entire time, which is extraordinary in and of itself. And so what I really want to go into now is really your your entrepreneurial journey and the journey you've gone through as a leader, as a man, um, in going through that. And so, you know, you you said to me once was that for you, starting a company was like giving birth to yourself. Glow's been around for 12, like 12 years now. And there's been a tremendous arc of things that have happened in that time. But I think the last three odd years in particular is especially interesting. Talk to us about the way out of a toxic culture. So continuing with this lit me up imagery, I, so I had a business before this and I was trying to get other ideas off the ground before this company. And I was quite unhappy with where I was across a variety of dimensions, psychologically, relationship, professionally. And so 
my way of addressing that at the time was to do a few things. I was going back to texts, literature, uh, things that inspired me like in my late teens, my early twenties, mm. things that, that really kind of, uh, lit up this, this faculty of wonder. And because that always felt very natural to me. And a lot of that reading was centered around some of the texts that I'd mentioned at the beginning. And I was also reigniting my meditation practice. I, because I, I was experimenting with it like back in, in the mid nineties and I was going off into yoga class, like the modern, modern postural yoga class that we all typically know yoga as sure. And I was also extremely fascinated with what was happening in the tech space at the time. This is 2007. I was constantly refreshing TechCrunch and Mashable. Uh, the ways in which that technology was being used, you know, not just only in, in a variety of ways, like in terms of, 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 uh, of, of creating and, and growing community of disseminating video of using these technologies to be of service, like some of the nonprofit initiatives that were, were starting to kind of come online and take advantage of some of these technologies back then. Just so fascinating to me again, like all these little things lit me up and actually tied. So a lot of them tied into some experiences that I had had leading up to this, which, which we don't have time for. And I was often, driving from Manhattan beach where I was living at the time to Santa Monica to go to yoga classes. And I was just so often late. And this one time I was stuck on Lincoln Boulevard and I was thinking, Oh, you know, so yeah. frustrated. Oh, good Angry. old Lincoln Boulevard. <laughs> yes. I remember the exact intersection and I just thought, why can't I just, you know, I could just beam this class into my living room and I wouldn't have to do this drive. And I would cut out all the anger and frustration and increase in cortisol and all that. And with that idea, I was so excited. I went to class and I just couldn't wait to get home. Like I, yeah. I, was, I was just buzzing and I couldn't wait to get home to see uh, if anyone was doing it. And so uh, then I started thinking, oh, you know, I have a really specific sensibility for the kind of teachers that I like. I didn't even know what a downward facing dog was until about five to six years after I had taken that philosophy course. Despite having been through India two times, <laughs> believe it or not, uh, you know, I, I just hadn't been introduced to this postural practice. And, uh, this one day when I was living in New York city, I ended up taking an, um, like a, a group, uh, fitness class. I think it was an abs class yeah, at this particular gym. And afterwards I was lying there tired, sweaty, uh, on the ground. Everyone was leaving. I was just worked because I hadn't done that type of work in a long yeah, time. Just like, Oh God. Yeah. yeah I was like, just <laughs> cover and people started walking in with mats under their arm. And I asked the person next to me, I said, what is this? And she said, yoga. I said, well, what do I need? She said, a mat. Like, I don't have one. Grab one from the corner. And so I grabbed it, did the class. And luckily, the woman who taught the class did so in this really mellifluous, lovely way, integrating music. Uh, she read from one of these texts that I referred to. Mm -hmm. uh, she even chanted. She had it had enough intensity that it 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 lit up the athlete in me and mm -hmm. afterwards i was buzzing i was mm -hmm. buzzing in a way that i was not buzzing after the abs class and i just thought wow i don't know what just happened to me but i, I i'm into to, it i need to continue tapping into this and that that just set off a, a journey of of exploring all the teachers in in new york city at the time and this was like 2001 or 2 i'm not sure exactly probably 2002. And so as I'm processing this thought on Lincoln Boulevard on my way, my way back uh, from the class, I'm thinking I have a very particular sense of, of what type of teacher gets it in, in quotes. Yeah. You know, not too far on the side of the spiritual and, and, and weird and culty, but also not too far on the side of just purely calisthenics. Like this, this nice middle ground. I mean, on our platform, we offer the whole spectrum, so I'm not downplaying any of it, but all of our teachers can teach to that, that spectrum. They have the capacity to, to do so, which means that they, they um, inhabit 
the, the, the range of that I'm speaking, speaking mm. of. Yeah. And I could speak a lot more to that, but I'll, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. And so then I started thinking I could add a nonprofit component to this. I could add a community component to this. I could add a tracking component to this where we could, we could, we could leverage, uh, you know, some of the, the experiences I had in terms of, of, of how we help people create healthy habits. And, and so I found someone who could help me build it to do the, the coding and we just, we just started building it. And, yeah. uh, I, I tried extremely hard to not rent a space because I was funding this myself. Yeah. And I, I tested out some existing spaces and, and I quickly realized that that wasn't going to be sustainable. So unfortunately I, and fortunately I set out trying to find a space and that took about like probably close to, to I'm guessing 10 ish months, maybe mm, I went, wow. through three, went through three brokers and I was known as this crazy guy trying to start this to get at your point back then this crazy yoga thing. Like, like what is, what is yoga? All my and, friends. And when is this in time? This is like 2009 ish. No, this is now two thousand. This is, so this is trying to find a space. This is 2000, 2007, 2007. And so we're just like incubation phase right now. Yep. Yep. I, I took the step to start building a little prototype. I took the step to create some test video because what I wanted to do was I wanted to create the experience of being in a real class at home. So I wanted people to see others because if you recall back then, DVD video was more like this kind of really flashy models. Yeah, super produced. Perfect, way overproduced, soap opera-like kind of backdrop. And I wanted the opposite of that. I just wanted to be beamed into the class, like, like Star Trek style. Yeah. And, and so, so we, I did a test of this concept and a little prototype and I sent it out to a few people. And... I just wanted to ask, like, does it feel like you're in a real class? Like, do you feel like you're there with the people? I, I didn't care so much, like, would this work for you as a service? Because it didn't exist yet. So I didn't, wouldn't expect for people to, to think, even subscription. Like, the New York Times dropped its paywall, I think, in 2010. Like, it was all ad-supported. I mean, we, we launched at, at, you know, the, at a time when the markets were just, just tanking. Yeah, really you're right, tanking. right. Like, the Lehman Brothers, the whole... I mean, everything fell apart right when you launched. Exactly. Exactly. And so when I saw that, you know, I could potentially bring all these different components together into one thing, it, it just, it, it, the, 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 and I'll stop relying on this imagery soon. Like the little things that kind of lit me up over all those years mm -hmm. com combined to make like a fire, yeah, like a conflagration, big bonfire. And it, 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 it it's when, when I think back on it, it was truly a surreal experience in that I almost had no choice. Like this thing was going to exist almost with or without me. Yeah. All the obstacles, all the challenges, all the weird shit that happened from betrayal to you name it. Like none of it mattered. I mean, it all affected me emotionally and physically, but it, 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 it none of it would have stopped me. Mm. And so the, initial product actually had the ability you could choose across three different nonprofit partners that we had chosen at the time. And the language that we, that I, that I'd written uh, was that in you know, some version of like you, you give to others by giving to yourself or your practice through your practice, you give to others by giving to yourself. And that we said that we would give 5% of our profits to one of the nonprofit partners of, of, of your choosing. Um, it was very naive. I, I quickly realized eight or nine months into it. I think I took it down August, two thousand or September 2009. And, but it's a, it was a big gaping hole in my, in my dream of, mm. of, of, of this service really being something that like you do through the platform. And in so doing, you're not just giving to yourself. You're also by becoming, by engaging well, or by learning to engage well, you're, you're giving back to others because your relationships are changing. You're navigating the world differently. You're, 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 you're spreading, you know, through example, like, like mindful behavior. Uh, but then I'll, in addition to that, like you're also making a financial impact. Like that was the, the fantasy. Um, kind of all and, of it stacking up, hitting on all these things simultaneously feels amazing. If you can find that, like that overlap, that, uh, that resonance. Exactly. Exactly. So you fast forward to 2016, we, we moved to a new space we were, we'd cobbled together about over that, that 
over those years, I, six or seven spaces that we kind of cobbled together. Mm. And about a block and a half away, we moved to a new space. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hesitating because I haven't yet spoken about this publicly. So I'm, if I'm stuttering or staggering, uh, bear with me. Uh, so just up until the point until we moved into our new office slash recording studios, we were using a lot of third parties for lots of different things. Mm -hmm. And I could see the limitations of that. You know, it was a lot of, of execution that I, I just dreamed that if we were all together as a unit, as a team, living, breathing, thinking, dreaming about this mission, that there would be, that, that more would come of it. Or would come of the experience. Sure. So wait, uh, let's just set the context here really quick. So at this point, it's 2016. You're like eight years into this crazy journey. And how and you, you've you've gone this crazy journey. You've been in multiple spaces, things across multiple cities. And how big is the team across, you know, third parties, contractors, whatever, but how many people are involved at this point? That's a great question. I I, I don't know at that point. You know, we you know, we were so we're still self-funded and you know the strategy all along was to make sure that there was more money at the end of the day or more money coming in than going out. I mean, that wasn't the case for like the first year and a half. Uh, I, I, I maxed out all credit cards and whatever lines of credit I had. But then after that, that was the strategy in terms of at least financial management. Generally a good rule for bootstrapping and business in right. general. Exactly. <laughs> so like, you know, a few things that, that I did that I wouldn't recommend other people do is like I, I handled customer support other than social media, all the other like tickets coming in, I, I did that all by myself. And how long? You know, how long like, did you do that? For four years. Wow, that is a long time. And I, 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 again, I don't recommend it. I don't wear it as a badge of honor. It's it prevented me from doing other things that were probably more important. Mm. Again, whole, we can do a whole separate episode just on, just on that. <laughs> just on the lessons learned. <laughs> yeah, and so you know, I, I really I have no idea how how big we were. I, I suspect if I'm were to guess, we were in the like on payroll probably. 15 ish range, mm -hmm. 15 to 20 maybe. And then when we moved into the new space, we ramped that up very quickly. Mm. Like we had the opportunity to uh, bring in not only individual people, but kind of little groups of, of people. And before I go into the next part, I just want to share that my way of dealing or addressing or trying to elicit kind of an internal commitment and inspiration towards my worldview of how I would want us to behave in terms of the cultural behavioral norms mm -hmm. uh, was e extremely limited. And my way of doing it was giving everyone a copy of Fred Kaufman's Conscious Business. I love that book. But how'd that go? As you would expect, <laughs> as, I, <laughs> as your laughter and tone suggests, you know, in, until you truly uh, operationalize all of that, it, it doesn't happen. I, I, I would do a lot of lunches, a mm. lot of one-on-one -on -one meetings, a lot of uh, you know, checking in with individuals in, in a way that wasn't scalable. You know, it, it, I, I hadn't developed the skills of, 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 you know, of how to move beyond that. And so when we did add more people. I think we got into the, the low 60s in terms okay. of people on, on payroll and, and, and probably a few people remote. It was all in the context of having zero end-to-end -end people ops strategy. Like by end-to-end, -end, I mean from interview to exit interview. No, you know, no sense of continuous performance management. No sense of what it takes to create psychological safety, foster growth mindset, etc. No no, none of that. No clarity around uh, what it means to be a manager, uh, how to do compensation, how to discuss compensation, how to give and receive feedback. I mean, none of that. Mm -hmm. And so what I learned in, in an extremely painful way is that all of those things that I just refer to, if they're not clear, they create voids. And people will fill those voids with their own versions of reality of how to behave. And so... By me not setting all that up, I, I like to think of it as like I helped create what we had at the time, which was a very dysfunctional and, and toxic culture. Uh, the first time I walked into Glow during a workday, there was a, 
I'm not even sure the right word, but like you could feel that there, you could feel like the intentionality in the place in a way, like you just walked in and you went like, Oh, something's different here. And even if you, mm. even if you couldn't quite like figure out exactly what it was, you could feel it, you know? And now that I've, I know you better, I know the company better. I would say it's a lot of living the values that you've so intentionally created and cultivated both personally and collectively over the last three years. And so I would love for you to actually describe the transition from 60 people to be in a void of expectations and just chaos going on and like, holy shit, what, what are we even doing to yeah. the experience I had, you know, a few months ago where I walked in and it was like, this just, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm over exaggerating a little bit, but it felt like clean and pristine and, and, and supportive and connected and like fill in your favorite, like positive buzzword here. But it felt like that and not in a bullshit way, but it actually did. And so I'd love for you to tell the story as someone who actually walked that walk, which I know is a hard walk. What did you do? How did you do that? Because I think you guys are actually doing what so many entrepreneurs, managers, actually want to create like you've talked about cultures creating a culture of continuous candid feedback having a culture where people care deeply but also perform and create tremendous results which is what everybody wants like you know that as you said that's a thing now but you're one of the first people i have a personal relationship with who's actually done it and is doing it so i would love for you to talk about how you did that okay so i'll go into it with the caveat that that please don't follow what i did <laughs> if you're listening if you're listening to this the whole thing but but first of all, i just want to acknowledge what you just said like that means so much to me that you felt that that, that that's and and it really comes down to you know I, I write a year-end email to our team every year and this year was it was short and i just said like you're all heroes to me <laughs> and i'm paraphrasing here but the the main reason why you're heroes is that over the course of the, the previous 12 months we we achieved a level of cohesiveness that we hadn't had for pretty much ever. And that requires, depending on where you're at in your own maturity and emotional intelligence, that requires a lot of going deep and addressing things that we, sometimes are painful to address. And so like, I just had this really end of year cracked open, heartwarming feeling. I just want everyone to know, like to me, you're heroes because you're, you're going, you're stepping into the ring and, and, I truly believe that what you're sensing is that you're sensing like people and we are just getting begin. We're just getting started rather. <laughs> That's so exciting. Uh, I don't, I don't want for anyone to think that we've nailed it, that it's a done deal. Like we're, we're just getting started. Uh, but I also want, want to acknowledge the in incredible contribution contributions that our team has, has, has made in order to create the energetic vibe that you're, you're now referring to. So it sounds like I they engaged well. They engaged well. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> that too. It was just, I mean, that's, that's what it was. <laughs> Good one. Um, so yeah, it took a few years. And, uh, you know, I, when I read, and in, in, I don't know if it was Patty McCord's book. Uh, you know, I, maybe I read that at the height of, 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 of this change, change management, change culture. You know, she, she, I think she mentioned that when they released their culture, now famous culture deck, that it, 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 it took a solid four years. For that to become realized and felt and operationalized and just for just for anyone who's not familiar who's listening patty mccord is the former chief basically the head of culture and people ops for netflix wrote a book called powerful uh it's all about business culture and, and uh i think was the sort of the lead person on the now infamous culture deck which if you haven't seen it'll be in the show notes definitely check it out but there you go yeah so cool yeah she's a she's a bit of a hero to me and we had someone come in to 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 kind of help us this is this is the, the moment that I realized is maybe uh, I should memorize these dates, but I'm guessing it was 2000, 2017, I'm guessing 2018. I don't, I don't know exactly. And it was after that, that I realized like, wow, okay, there's a lot that's, that's not well here. And what I did, which I don't recommend you do. I, I, I kind of went to my cave. This is how I used to handle things. I'd go to my cave. I would go to all my sources. I, came out of the cave with a 45 page document of all the things that mattered to me that really start to flesh out the behavioral boundaries and guidelines that I, I wished for, for us, whittled that down to nine pages through the help of, of the, the team at the time. And I met with every single person for 30 minutes in succession over the course of, I think seven to eight days. And it really depends on on the individual, but uh, you know those conversations went in a whole 
spectrum of ways and from like, yeah, this I'm, I'm on board with this. Like, let's, how can I help to just to be clear when you were going into that conversation? So you're meeting with every single person in the company and you have this nine pager in your hand. What do you, what are you saying to them? What was the context for this conversation? Like, what are they walking in thinking is going to happen? So I asked them to, to read it ahead of time. And the context was, if I remember this correctly, it was a while ago, and I'm sure I've re- repressed some of this, uh, it's, it's how can I help? Like, how, how, how can I help create more clarity? Because I, I'm acknowledging that I have not created clarity. I have not done my job to, to, to create the clarity that's needed, nor create the conditions to generate the cohesiveness. You know, I'm leaning on Patrick Lencioni. Mm-hmm. And so, like I said, those conversations were all over the board from how can I help? I'm on board. Let's do this together to, uh, these, these are, these concepts are idealistic. This is not how the world works. Mm. And, uh, I, I then began to have a greater appreciation for just how varied the human experience is in the workplace. You know, some people are coming from environments where toxicity or certain types of behaviors that, that I consider toxic are actually rewarded. And so you know, I, I then began to really feel, and, and in some cases, like tears generating, tears coming to my, to my eyes yeah. and like, wow, like this is, there, some people really experience some trauma and PTSD in certain places. And, and so mm. this just began a very multi-year long journey of like, how can we move through this together and how can I become better at generating inspiring clarity and and um, the things that gen- would, would ultimately lead to creating a more cohesive and psychologically safe environment mm-hmm. the part i want to g- get to here is initially like, i don't want to make it sound that i i showed up in such a helpful way initially like like my instinct at the time was more you know, because i was still we, we hadn't fully transitioned all operations to our coo yet at that point Mm-hmm. I was still addicted to being busy. I was mm. still addicted to, well, let me rephrase that. I was, I was, I, I still had firmly rooted my sense of adequacy and self-worth in being part of certain work streams and putting out certain fires consistently. And that, that really gave me a sense of, of value. And I wasn't even aware that that was the case. And so what I mean in terms of my way of dealing with it not being helpful, you know, because I told myself I was too busy to go the full distance on this, I would do things like just just read this or just listen to this and just be like this and we're gonna be okay. We're gonna be okay. Got it. Or or that or or we can we can work through this stuff together through the lens of this particular framework or model or uh, I'm being intentionally vague here because I don't want to bring up any particular situations or you know, like all of this is there's so much nuance to, to all of this. Um, but the reason why I share this is because I realized pretty quickly thereafter, I'm maybe like three or four months into attempting to do it that way, that it, it wasn't the way that it wasn't helpful. And so yeah, that then signaled to me that if this isn't going to work, I need to work on changing myself. That was the perspective shift. Yes, just hitting, hitting, hitting the same walls over and over again. It just like, all I had left was to think, what can I? If I can't change others, all I can do is change myself. Hmm. And so that's that began my journey back to therapy, uh, the, my journey to finding uh, a leadership forum that I was in for a year, my journey to finding the right coaches that that worked for me that I'm still working with. And I've experienced so many fascinating unlocks, but, but one I'm, I'm trying to choose the ones that might be the most interesting or helpful is that the more I create the space in myself, the more others have the space to operate in ways and show up and be in ways that are more in the spirit of bringing their whole selves to work. Versus if I am not spacious within myself, I constrict space. I constrict the space for others. And that does the opposite of, of what I just said. 
Oh man, let me just say this is the first time. Maybe I said this earlier. This is the first time I'm I've, I've spoken to this publicly. So I just want to acknowledge that this this isn't easy, and, and I, uh, I I'm certain that. Well, I appreciate you being willing to, by the way, because this is the actual stuff that people grapple with. Yeah, and, and I know I'm gonna after this think, oh, you know, I wish I'd said that differently. But look, if it can be helpful to others, then then let's go for it. So at this point, it's maybe late 2017, maybe early 2018, somewhere in there. You're into the process of of shifting the culture, right? You you went into your cave, you came back with this giant manifesto. You worked with the team and whittled it down to something that was actually you know uh, consumable. So then you began the process of meeting with everybody and trying to get this ball rolling and start to turn the tides or turn the turn the ship, so to speak. And you spent several months working on that, realized, okay, a lot of stuff I'm doing isn't working. And then you had your big epiphany moment of like, okay, I can't change other people, but I can work on myself. And so what I'm curious about is after that, you were do at this point, you're doing your work personally, but now you're, you're, you're working in two streams at once, so to speak. You're working on yourself and your own stuff. And then there's still the work that has to be done to change the environment and the culture within the company outside of you. And I'm curious how you navigated between that internal and that external. How did you walk that path ping ponging back and forth between looking within, doing whatever you had to do there, and then taking that outside and, and vice versa? Yeah. So I, I just want to acknowledge that if we look at this on a scale of like, I don't know, zero to 10, where zero is the starting point of this, this particular um, moment this particular range of time that we're discussing and like 10 is is fully past it on, and on the other side you know I, I, i'm probably like me personally not the team because the team is is we're we're, we're past it in, in a very awesome way but me personally i'm probably still at like an eight eight and a half mm-hmm. so it, when you're shifting what has worked for a long period of time. And when what has worked, as I mentioned earlier, is inextricably bound to sense of self-worth and adequacy, to shift that, at least for me, in my experience, was not trivial. Yeah. And it wasn't always pretty, and it still isn't. You know, in fact, this call that I referred to earlier, like there are just a few little remnants of of that transition that uh, I would say are the source of of that trigger. And you know, we being self funded, I, I no matter what, if you're funded or self funded, like you're always managing to a budget, and resources are always limited, but you know, constantly walking this very fine line, how much can I invest in change, not just for myself, but with our team? And how much can I invest in pushing the product forward, Mm -hmm. pushing the user experience forward, pushing, supporting our members forward. And often we over-indexed on many of the former, like supporting our members, pushing the product forward. and, And though the cultural individual group dynamic self-improvement work was just always incredibly important to me. You know, the decisions of like, well, do we spend on this or do we spend on that? I mean, just agonizing for me because you know? yeah. I could see the light at the end of the tunnel of, 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 of where we're at now. I was just within grasp for, for, for so frequently. And, and, you know, given the size of our team and given that I'm not, I'm not someone unless you do something incredibly egregious. I don't just fire people. Mm-hmm. I, I, you know, we, we, you know, we're certainly better now at through continuous performance management. People knowing where they stand at any given point in time. You know, without that, people don't really know where they stand. Without any kind of, you know, clarity around how we how we hold one on ones, how we do quarterly performance reviews, how we have, uh, you know, individual and professional development conversations, like all of that. Without any of that in place, you know, you know what that's like. Possibly. It can get very um, chaotic, confusing. Right. And so I, I don't, I don't, I can't, I can't just say to you, you know, I, I flipped a switch and, and all was well. It, it was just this, it was this, this just constant iterative process of what can we do now? What can we do in this quarter on these things? How can we continue to move the ball down the road? And uh, it wasn't until 2019 where we started working with the, this, these two wonderful women 
dynamic duo, Tiffany and Bentley, where we finally mapped out like a, here is the entire spectrum of what we want to accomplish in terms of people ops, in terms of our core values, in terms of, uh, of, of operationalizing them, uh, in terms of, uh, refining our why statement and how that then becomes integrated into all that we do in, in terms of what's in appropriate ways. So, yeah, I think what you're asking is, is, is like, how was that for me personally? Like making that shift was not trivial. How did it change you? So here's a whole separate story of when we switched over from an older version of our platform to a newer version of our platform. As I mentioned, we had more features, at least more public facing features. Uh, that's not so much the case now, but more obvious public facing features than, than, we, than we do now. And we're, we're bringing all those back this year. But I underestimated our ability to bring those back quicker. And so I had a lot of shame around not being able to accomplish that, about around mm-hmm. not, not being able to uh, create cohesiveness, assemble a, a cohesive team. And so, you know, I was wrestling with a lot of, of, of shame and, 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 you know, pre-therapy, pre-leadership group, I wasn't fully aware of that. And so mm-hmm. the ways in which my shame would manifest and express itself were not healthy. And yeah. so the more that I became aware of those dynamics within me, that then led to a greater awareness of, of how those were manifesting as either action or inaction. And so then I could, I could begin to develop you know, healthy functional responses to, to my, my shame. You know, there's a phrase you said to me the first time we hung out in person that, um, is coming to mind right now that I'm wondering if it's, if it's what you're referring to here. I think you were quoting this fantastic book, the Bhagavad Gita, which you gave me a copy of the first time we hung out. And there was a, a phrase in there you quoted, I think, which was something to the effect of, we are entitled to our actions, but not the fruit of our actions. And you were, the point you were trying to make to me was it was about, there was something very important about owning the intentionality of what we do and releasing the illusion of control over the outcome. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The thing with that text is depending on which translation you read, the, the words will vary in some cases quite, quite drastically. And just to work clear, this is the Douglas Brooks translation. Yeah. I highly recommend it. It's, he also lectures on our platform if you want to go deeper. So when I first read that when I was 23, that was one of the things that kind of like shook me to my core. Like, to focus on action, not the fruits of action. Like, what did that mean? That's exactly and, what I wanted to ask you. What does that mean? <laughs> please, please enlighten us. You know, I mean, so much you probably can observe in, in yourself or anyone listening, Let's do a little experiment on yourself, like this gap between like where I am now and where I want to be. Like there's always some gap, you know, across some, some dimension and imagining that like, oh, if I only could get there, I will be blank or I will experience blank, or I will feel blank. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that the sense that I want to do the thing only for the fruit of doing that thing, depending on what the fruit is. So like, if I want to do, if I set out to do that thing because I want to look good, or I want people to respect me, or you know, if the fruit somehow is tapping into some shadow aspect of myself that I'm not fully aware of, it, it, it likely causes some type of unsatisfaction or dissatisfaction or suffering or mm-hmm. so that's what that means to me. Like to focus on action less on the fruit of action. And I think that also has evolved for me over the years too is like outcomes are great. Outcomes are wonderful. Goals are wonderful. If we're not setting goals and trying to work towards them and, and achieve them. And that's, that's a p- potentially a problem too. I mean, there are some people who, who don't need to, I think of people living in caves and <laughs> trying, trying not to, you know, trying not to accomplish something or, and, uh, it's, it's, it's just all the work in the state, that statement signals to me, the work is in how I experience that fruit. My, it, the, am I clinging to it? Am I attached to it? Am I, uh, I think you said this to me the first time I asked you about it, but it's about grounding ourselves in 
the intention, right? It's it's releasing right. the illusion of control of the outcome because we don't control outcomes. Like, sure, right. result. I, look, I love results. I love love outcomes. So uh, I. Love them, and I, I go hard after them. But I know, and, and it, uh, you know, on some some level, it breaks my ego to know this. But I don't control them, and right. so all I really have is to control how I show up, to control what is my intention, how am I moving this forward or or hurting it. Um, and that's really what I hear in that is that is sort of that. And, and when you said that sort of when you're coming from the, the shadow side, um, that it tends to create that sort of dissatisfaction or, or the, I, I've been studying a lot of Buddhist, Buddhist thought in the recent six months. And it, it reminds me of the word dukkha, which is often translated as suffering. Um, but I actually like the other trans, another translation of that word, which is sort of um, unsatisfactoriness, this idea yes. that something's just not quite, you know, it's just not quite yeah. satisfying. Um, yeah. Did, did you get that in uh, what the Buddha taught? Is that where you? Uh, no, I, I try to remember where I where I first learned. I think I learned that on retreat. Uh, so I've gone on, on numerous uh, meditation retreats, and it, I think it was on one of those where there was um, a Dharma talk, which is sort of like a almost like a Buddhist sermon or sort of like a philosophical talk at night uh, every night, and and uh, one of the teachers spoke to that. Yeah, I prefer that word as well. The, which one? The unsatisfactoriness? Uns- unsatisfactoriness. Yeah. yeah. You know, another, so just to use another line from the Bhagavad Gita, which, which I took with me and, and was kind of like a, uh, almost like the future calling to me. It's, you know, it's better to do one's own duty imperfectly than another's well. Hmm. And I think it ties into your comment about control. Like if we're trying to control some sort of outcome that may not necessarily be fully aligned with, with who we are, I find it typically leads to some sort of unsatisfactory experience. Um, I just want to say one more thing about control and, and it, it speaks to your, your question earlier in terms of my own psychological journey with, with all of this and that my wife and I have been in doing IVF for the last seven, seven years and mm. we, we uh, recently made some decisions that uh, which certainly have, um, which made us truly face that we certainly do not control the life that we had fully imagined for ourselves as coming to fruition. Mm. And our confronting the degree of attachment that we had to this imagined or perceived version of how things would fold, unfold relinquishing that I, I can't stress enough how much that also fed into how I experience control in the work environment and how it's, it's also let me examine where I'm clinging and, and, and trying to control. Yeah. So I don't know. I just want to add that, add that. No, that's, that's really powerful. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, you know, one of the things that really stands out to you, sorry, to me about you is that, and this is something I think I really appreciate about, about, not just you as a, as a person and as a, as a leader of a company, but the example you're setting for the culture is that you do, you seem to do an extraordinary job in my, from my, from where I sit of toggling between reflection and action and weaving those two together on an ongoing basis and having your action be informed by your reflection and your reflection actually be informed by your action. You know, the, the sentences you just said, just really speak to that to me. And I think that's very, I just think that's really cool and wanted to acknowledge that. Nice. Yeah, I, I would say that's accurate. I'm glad to hear that. Um, you know, it's interesting you were, you were just saying about, about the journey you, you and your wife have been on because one of the things that it just occurred to me is also unique about the story of Glow and, and your story is, you know, not only have you built this extraordinary business and this extraordinary company, of course, like any company, it's had its ups and its downs, its challenges. Um, you've done it in a way that is oddly out of vogue right now in this, the fact that you've self-funded this thing as opposed to going down the, you know, the shiny VC scale at all costs, you know, unicorn valuation, take over the universe <laughs> play. Um, but in addition to that, you, in a lot of ways, it's a family business. You started it with your brother, you work with your brother and your wife. And that to me is also extraordinary. I was just wondering like, what is that like? And how do you navigate the, what I have to imagine there's, there's like, how do you navigate those different roles in, in the, the merging and the blending of all those different roles of, you know, the role you play at home versus the office and navigate. Like, how do you do that? Cause I, and I, and I say this because I have, I have gone into business with friends before and righteously fucked it up. So I'm asking this selfishly about like, <laughs> and for other people out there, cause I know this is not an easy thing. And so I'm just asking. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, I, I fuck up every day. <laughs> so 
there isn't a day that goes by where I'm just not feeling some sort of regret. And so like, just be kind, be kind to yourself as much as possible. So, uh, so my brother and I had the benefit of working on a business prior to this. So we, we worked out some of our kinks. And uh, then once we started doing this one, we got the we had the opportunity to work on many more <laughs> kinks. Uh, we've we've been to therapy together, which has helped. Uh, both myself, my brother Ryan, and my wife Lisa, and um, our our COO Brett, we each uh, work with coaches, coaches um, at Reboot. Okay. Uh, so we, I would, uh, we weren't great at this initially, uh, but we're much better at it now of being vulnerable with each other on things that are typically not discussed in a work environment. Like I'm afraid of this or I'm, I, by, by us discussing that it triggers me in this way and here's why. And, uh, you know, we've created the space where we can go to places that are probably not typically appropriate. Hmm. You know, like, like I, I can fully say to all four, all three of them, that uh, this particular topic or dynamic you know, you know, triggers a particular uh, conditioning that I acquired in childhood, for example, and like they they have similar conversations you know, with me. And I'm not saying we always go there. I mean, it's pretty pretty rare because, but you're able to, but we're able to, which is fantastic. And that wasn't always the case. And so uh, I would say that we probably, I would say the company would be an. Ex- in a pretty bad place if we weren't able to have conversation in, in that way. And, and, and when we do have friction, disagreement, or, or when we show up in ways that are unhelpful, we address it, we address it right away. And we, we don't, we don't go to bed with it. We, we talk it out. Uh, you know, my, my wife and I, we have a rule that we, we don't talk about, business past 8 p.m. Mm, okay. Uh, we let that slide sometimes when it's good news. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, no really hard conversations after 8 p.m. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the tough part is that it's never off. Like it's, 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 it's not an exaggeration to say that it's 24 seven. That's, that's the, the tough part. And what we in the last, I'm, I'm guessing here four or five, six months have gotten extremely intentional about is is turning it off because we've in some ways we have acknowledged the, the how we are experiencing some burnout mm. and and so we're just becoming much more aware of when certain aspects of how, how we're interacting or how we're we're intersecting with our broader team that just no longer serves either the four of us or serves our team mm, yeah. and so you know specifically my brother and my wife uh, and I we're pretty much not part of anything operational at this point. Although Lisa, my wife, um, as chief sustainability officer, uh, is heading up the the component of when we haven't launched it yet, but the component of engagement with our platform as giving back to our planet. Mm-hmm. So our, our refined why statement is that we connect people through self care so that together we can heal ourselves and our planet. Mm, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. So I'm curious. So I think this is a great opportunity to talk a little bit about that why and that the the core values you've just been rolling out. And one of the things you said to me, I don't remember if we were recording or not, was that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily recommend the, you know, founder goes into a cave, comes back from the mountaintop with the the stone tablets approach. So yeah. how did you, how did you do it this time? Was it different? Okay. So I, I should memorize the date on this as well, but there was a, a time where the, the nine pager was, pr- was pretty solid and <clears throat> pr- pretty much everyone on our team now. Uh, with the exception of maybe two, three or four, uh, sat with me as the final interview. And before the interview, they would read the nine pages. And then I would spend one to two hours discussing it with them. Right. So this culture doc was a, was a piece of the part, part of the process coming into the company. Correct. Okay. Got you, it. you didn't, you didn't join the team until you read the document and spent some time with me. Got it. And, uh, but that too, that was from me. Or, or from me, Brett Ryan. Okay. So, so, so it wasn't what we wanted it to be. We wanted it to be self-emergent. And what I mean by that is when I mentioned Bentley and Tiffany earlier, uh, 
you know, part of the scope of work with them was to uh, set up a uh, two groups, both the, the four of us, and then um, another group, which uh, it was uh, at the time a representative sample of our team. Hmm. And we did like, a, I think she called it a values affinity mapping process. And okay. uh, all with the intention of like, who are we now? Who are we at our core? And what, a, what about who we are now is what we want to preserve and codify and operationalize. And are there any aspects that we're seeing are also a bit aspirational so that we can grow into mm. ways of being that we just know we have the capacity to do so living into that potential. Exactly. And so what was truly awesome at this time, the team had evolved quite a bit. And so we were, we were uh, in a good position to do this. And, uh, as, as Bentley and Tiffany referred to it, luckily both groups aligned very well. <laughs> they were done independently and then they merged all of all of the words. Got it. And so they, they've so, really facilitated this process. Uh, right. And so right. we ended up okay. with three core values uh, the, and each have four respective key behaviors. Okay. And so uh, the first one is grow awareness. Second one is nurture kindness. And the third is practice curiosity. Okay. So awareness, kindness, and curiosity. Yeah. And then under awareness, we have be open to possibilities, own actions and reactions, reflect, learn, and integrate, and grow comfortable with the unknown. Under nurture kindness, we have venture to be vulnerable, express yourself, see clarity. I'll repeat that. See clarity, hold each other accountable. And under practice curiosity, we have verify stories and assumptions. Hmm. That's a big one. That's my, actually my favorite. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Consider ideas from anyone. Try new approaches and listen with care. We almost didn't go with, with kindness. Hmm. What was it almost instead? Well, care, care and kindness kept coming up as, as words that it already exist. Mm-hmm. And I, I had experienced the misinterpretation of care and kindness enough. And so had others on our team to be extremely wary of going. What do you, what do you mean by that with the, the misinterpretation? Well, uh, you know that feeling you referred to, like when you walk into a space and you just feel something is, yeah. is, is awesome. I think you can also feel that in a, when, when a culture is defined as a nice culture. Ah, uh, okay. You know, and a nice culture, in my experience, can be as toxic as an overtly not nice yep. cult- culture. You know, and, until you until you join the team and work with each other, you know, niceness can, can be, you know, it can keep people from having the hard conversations. Absolutely. Example, it can do so many other things, but. You know, I love it. This, this is echoing a lot of, um, a lot of ideas that can have come up in, in the research and conversations on this, on the show so far around, uh, particularly around psychological safety. Um, I'm going to reference the conversation with Amy Edmondson in particular. Um, there was an entire bit in there about, this idea of niceness, you know, in air quotes, right? And it's like, oh, everyone has that, not everyone, but many places have that version of like, oh, we're such and such company nice, right? Meaning we're not going to tell it like it is. We're not going to be real. We're going to be maybe too nice, too polite. But the, um, for some reason, Brene Brown comes to mind right now of like unclear is unkind. And, and that ki- kindness can actually be um, very challenging, right? Or, or to, you know, Another, I, I knew we were going to be really good friends when I walked into your office and you had like 12 copies of Ran- Radical Candor on your bookshelf. And I was like, okay, we're going to be cool. <laughs> right? And so uh, Kim Scott's whole thing about, you know, that, that dimension of caring personally and simultaneously challenging directly is, yep. it seems like that real sweet spot that um, is enabled by what you're, what you're speaking to. Yeah. The way I explain it in interviews, it's, I have, I have a, a longer way of explaining it, but the short version is like, how do we create a culture that is both kind and high performing? Yeah. Therein lies the tension. Yeah. So how you do it? <laughs> Obviously, it's a work in progress, but how are you doing it now? Yeah. So we mapped out pretty much a 12-month journey. I keep mentioning Bentley and Tiffany with, with the two of them to uh, you know, some of these, like you mentioned, verify stories and assumptions as, as being a, a good one. Mm, yeah. You could, you could imagine a whole set of training around that and how by not verifying stories and assumptions, you know, that can lead to like misattributing something it can lead to gossip it can lead to triangulation uh you know so some of these are 
going to require more uh, education and training and support than others. You know, even growing awareness, like how 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 do you set up systems, process, rituals where you know, behaving mindfully is is a norm? Mm -hmm. That's maybe we can do an interview a year from now, and I can I can share with you how that how that all went. But I'd love to. It, it will. It, we have a, a bunch of workshops, a bunch of exercises, a bunch of um, ways of adding to the continuous performance management systems that we that we've set up. So I, I highly recommend something like a fifteen five or or a lattice you know, to support that. Uh, you know the. So basically, well, the thing the thing that it sounds to me like you're doing that based on my own research and what I've seen out there is. Uh, bodes very well is that you're you're avoiding the trap that values fall into which is that values stay like platitudes and they're just nice ideas but they have no grounding in reality but by going all the way to like what does this value look like in reality in action you actually enable accountability to values where you know there can be peer-to-peer -peer, you know feedback of like hey derek in that meeting i saw you do x and that was amazing and i also saw you do this other thing which you know looks like a point where you're you're you're, you know, you're something you want to work on or have a look at. Um, and so it, it seems like that's really what these continuous performance management systems are going to enable you to do. Is that, is that the idea here that it'll let you put that into your, your sort of ongoing cycles of, of reflection and review? Right, 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 right. I think it was your second, your second interview. I, I forgot her name. Uh, she spoke to the cadence, the importance of cadence. Mm, Christina Woodkey. And that's what these tools do. They, they, they make it top of mind. Yeah. And easy to repeat. As Christina would say, it's all about the cadence. Right. It doesn't mean the work is easy. Yeah. The, the, the conversations does, aren't necessarily easier. Uh, but if, if, if we can all agree to like how we give and receive feedback or how we, how we navigate defensiveness, you know, and, and so on and so on, then, you know, these conversations become more, I don't know, less personal, um, but yeah, to, ask, to answer your question, like weekly check-ins, one-on-ones, how do we do one-on-ones? As I mentioned, how do we, how do we give and receive real-time feedback? Like how are we doing quarterly reviews? You know, we, so you're actually baking these into all of those processes. Exactly. How do we have, how do we have wage improve, wage um, increase or just wage discussions? Like how do we, how do we have performance issue discussions? Uh, you know, how do we like, I see all of all of this stuff as really how do we support people in becoming their best selves, and mm -hmm. like how do we support our team in 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 being like like practicing and nurturing kindness uh, while performing in ways that are you know, we've used the, the phrase high performance, but like you know, we all we all want to be challenged and we all want to grow, and so how do we support that? And I, I really see that as like a, like a core focus of, of my job. Yeah, for sure. And, and uh, just because you said it, I'm going to give, you know, give a shout out here to 15.5. Actually, I love their podcast and their material uh, in particular on best self management is I find it to be a really accessible and thorough and well thought out framework for thinking about this. And, and uh, so we'll link to that in the show notes and anyone who's finding this an interesting topic, I definitely recommend checking it out. Yeah. And part of the they they're amazing. Shane and uh, um, David are just like just awesome people. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we actually created our own best self playbook. And uh, like we we define best self management, which is totally borrowed, and and it, I may even be plagiarizing here. So if I am, I don't I don't claim ownership of this in any way. As an ongoing process of coaching, reflection, and two way communication that supports people in increasing their self awareness and becoming their best selves. Hmm. Nice. So yeah, and to, and to wrap it up, like management training, and you know how do we how do we foster and psychological safety? How do we uh, foster growth mindset, uh, internal locus of control versus external locus of control. Like how, do, how do we, how do we practice when we're, when we're being victim, villain, hero, you know, anyone who's listened to this podcast enough by now is familiar with a lot of the ideas we're discussing here, which is great. And I'm so happy as someone like you, who's committed to using business as a vehicle and a force for good and, and being a, a change agent in the world and in people's lives. I'm really, I'm stoked that this is a thing now. That's great. Full stop. My question is this. So we have a lot of good ideas. There's a lot of great work that's been done out there, right? About psychological safety and radical candor and best self-management and you know, on and on and on. All these fantastic tools, ideas, etc. Here's what I'm wondering about on a very tactical, practical level. 
how do you create, and this is maybe the wrong way to say it, but how do you get people on board with the process itself of, hey, we're going to work in a different way than most people work. And we're going to have types of conversations that maybe you're not used to having in the workplace. They might be more personal than you're used to because, you know, we are who we are, whether we're in the office or not. So that's what I'm really curious about is sort of that, um, I'll just say buy-in. Yeah, makes two of us. <laughs> Damn, I was hoping you knew. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> well, if I find anything, I'll send it to you. Yeah, you know, I, I, uh, I think it's going to be different for every team. I, you know, certainly forcing doesn't work. Yeah. You know, I love how Fred Kaufman speaks to elicit, these are his exact words, eliciting the internal commitment of others to blank, to... That's powerful. Uh, help help manifest the vision to, to, to uh, behave in ways that are values aligned. Yeah. Again, like listening, the internal commitment of others to, to do what it is that you're, so it, I think, and I, that's stuck with me and it's, and it's, it's memorized because I, I have learned that that truly is the only way. Like there's no forcing, there's no, Hey, go be like this or go be like that or go read this. And then ta-da, yeah. you're going to be, a, you're going to be mindful and you're going to constantly practice self-awareness and, yeah, creating like I think you know when when um I guess it was Project Aristotle that let, arrived at uh, psychological safety and yep uh, you know I mean, there's a reason why right that that's the number one component or attribute of high performing teams it, it just makes so much sense I think if you can create an environment where it's safe to take interpersonal risks in a group dynamic then. It, it it does seem that these things will work themselves out in conversation. Now, part, one thing that I do now in these interviews, I mentioned you know years ago when we were using that nine page document, I would straight up say, "Look, this is not how the real world works out there. I know that it's been reflected back to me as such that this is a little maybe utopian, but this is also I'm trying to create a place where." you know, in the spirit of, of so much of our discussion today is it, there is no perfection. There's just being in the ring and yeah. there's just sh showing up mm -hmm. and endeavoring to engage well. And that if, if, if you're up for that, great. If you're up for the discomfort that that will most certainly bring great, then this is a place for you and we will do everything we can as a team and as a company to, to provide support for that. But if not, like this is a great chance for you to like eject from this interview process. Yeah, like this. This I mean, is not the right. almost ver <laughs> almost verbatim what I say. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm curious. You, you used to have them read the nine pager. What do you do today now that you've you know you've evolved a lot more? So the the three core values with the respective key behaviors. There's they each have also two paragraphs. Okay. So now it's it's just that, and it don't it takes it takes much. It's it's a it's a much shorter read. You know, there, uh, there's so many good ideas out there and there's so many ways to implement good ideas. And from what I can tell, most of the implementation of these things fails. And the reason it usually, well, there's a lot of reasons it fails, but I think one of the biggest ones is that is actually a void of leadership. It's a, it's a lack of actual leadership to do the really, really hard, like the brutally hard inner internal work to have the conversations that you've had to explore, make the hard values assessments, right? To, to basically be willing to take a stand for saying like, no, no, this, these are the things, this is what we are here to do. And this is the way we hold ourselves accountable to showing up and engaging, engaging well. And, and the fact that you've done that work, I think is, I'm, I'm curious, A, if you agree with that. First, I would say, is, do you agree? Is that actually the thing that's making the difference here? Or is it something else? I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree more. I would change the word done to doing. Okay. In the same way, in the same way that we started off, like, done that work that oh, you were yeah. doing, doing right? in the that same work. way that, that we started this conversation with living into. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you for that correction. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I, I thousand percent agree. And this is this is what our manager training will just. It'll be about a lot of things, a lot of tactical things, but more like the. Uh, I, I, I look forward to the day that the phrase "soft skill" is re replaced with something else, but. You know, it's also like the tactical plus the soft skills. And yeah, the, the, the just as an alternative phrasing, by the way, that um, a guest who will uh, another episode that will come out shortly um, is changing it to either say human skills or power skills. Ooh, I'm going to go with human skills. 
Yes, I like that. And and I I, I couldn't agree more. Like I I, I just see it. I, I've just seen it play out um, you know, with myself and with others. That if you're not if you're not constantly engaging with moving the needle on the human skills, yeah, the rest is just like window dressing. Yeah, you're just going to repeat the same mistakes over and over again. Is in my experience. Yeah, my, my my whole thing about this, just speaking to my own my own ex- work experiences, is that um, without the, I was going to say the top cover, but without basically leadership, the, the presence of leadership saying the kinds of things you're saying, there is not a it's it's not safe for people to go there. And my experience has been that when it's not safe for people to go there, um, that most people, not everybody, but most people won't because they they don't like they feel this sort of artificial boundary between the personal and the professional, so to speak. And what I've noticed is that when, like, if you're not willing to have these very human conversations, and I'm using that word very deliberately, like the the human side of life and business, which is the emotional stuff, it's the hard stuff, it's all the things we're talking about in this conversation. My experience has been that when people are unwilling or unable for whatever set of reasons, including environmental, cultural reasons, to have those conversations, that there is only so far you can take things, especially in the domain of performance. Um, and so I, ironically for people who are, because this usually shows up in very like quote performance oriented cultures, but the great irony to me is that uh, you can't actually perform to your best and increase your level of performance without going to these places. It, that's my belief. I don't know that that's true in any objective sense. Yeah. I mean, I think it, it was Christina, right? In episode two, uh, Christina wiki. Yeah. Yeah, I think she even said as much that the the, the 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 research is pointing in that direction. I mean, the fact that now, you know, pretty frequently the Harvard Harvard Business Review cover has some component that or some feature that's addressing these topics. Um, you know, the business schools now are are, are teaching. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's right. Like she, that. she talked about the touchy feely class at Stanford as the most popular right. class at Stanford's business school, which is like one of the top business schools in the world. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, before I forget, just a shout out to, to your other interviews that I've, I've listened to. Like they're really good. I, I highly recommend other people listen to them. Like, which, which one made the difference for you? Really special. Uh, you know, Barry, Barry Brown, right? Is that, ah, I love Barry. You know, there's, there, you know, that, gosh, that I needed to listen to that one when I listened to it. You know, there, there, there's, I, I'm not going to recall all of it, obviously, but there, you know, that, that whole segment or, uh, conversation that the two of you had around um, raising the flagpole and see who gathers around. Yeah. Um, and, and just all the stuff that, that, uh, that, that had to do with uh, Amy Edmondson. Amazing. Like I, I'm a huge fan. She's awesome. Of hers. So just keep doing what you're doing. Uh, absolutely. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Yeah. You're welcome. If, to fully answer your question, like I, I, I'm, I'm learning. We're learning as a team. Like we're we're kind of just getting started, and you know, I I have a big smile on my face, which you can see because I'm I I am really kind of for the first time ever. It's a recent phenomenon for me. Like I'm I'm okay with that. I'm okay with us not being perfect. I know that's a big step for you, and that's that's uh, I really acknowledge that. That's powerful. So congratulations on on that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. But by that he means I I I disclose that perfectionism. Yeah, I used to have a much tighter grip on my sense of, of reality and self than, than it does now. I too am a recovering perfectionist, so I'm right there with you. Shout yeah. out, by the way, a book that I found very helpful that if you haven't checked out, I think you'd, you would dig uh, on this topic specifically is a book called How to Be an Imperfectionist. Mm, who, by whom? Uh, gosh, let me look it up. Hold on. Uh, by Stephen Guise. Guise is G-U-I-S-E. Nice. I'll check it out. Yeah. Really good one. So I want to I want to start to wrap up here, but I actually want to ask you. There's something that occurred to me that I want to ask you. A lot of businesses, I mean, especially if you look at it statistically, most businesses do not last that long, right? Most are many are gone within a year, maybe five years, whatever. The stats are are what they are. You've been at this now for something like twelve years, and which is an extraordinary accomplishment in and of itself. Particularly the way you've done it, and I'm so excited about that. And one of the things that I wonder about is I've never worked on anything for twelve years. Yeah. And I can only imagine all the ups and downs you've gone through, the the, the tough times, the good times, et cetera. But what I'm wondering about is, you know, you, you were speaking to burnout a little bit earlier with the four four of you at the, the senior level of the company. How do you I'm gonna you say stoke the fire? Basically, like how do you keep the fire alive for something for that long? Because that is a, is a, seems like a really important thing to going the distance. 
So I'll just address burnout briefly because I don't mean burnout in like burnt out around the the idea or the mission or in, in, in terms of enthusiasm. Okay. I, I, I was referring specifically to, uh, you know, certain behaviors or certain habit loops or certain ways of being and operating, not producing results or, you know, certain bottlenecks allowing to persist or certain ways of, of being as a group just not working. And so the, the, the recognition of this just isn't working. Let's change it. And, and a business is always doing that. I'm not suggesting like we're just, oh, oh, we just now finally realize this thing is working. It's more, yeah, it's more of, of, of like, like certain things that you just kind of let persist mm-hmm. that, that if you were to continue to let them persist longer for those things that, that are truly taxing on an emotional, psychological level of, of just crying uncle and mm-hmm. saying enough. Yeah. Like, okay. Like this is something that is hard to address, but we're mature enough, adult enough to put it all on the table and say, and have a discussion around how are we going to address this? So I just want to be clear about, about that, uh, in terms of burnout, I didn't want to be misunderstood on that. And yeah, then, thank you for clarifying. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a very easy answer to your question. I, so I, one thing I didn't mention back when I, uh, was first exposed to the word yoga in that class many years ago. I had this, what I felt at the time was naive, and I I still feel that way, but I still believe it, a uh, point of view that if more humans uh, would engage in some type of uh, contemplative, reflective, ongoing mindfulness type practice, and I don't mean just sitting on a cushion, I mean like mindfulness can be practiced throughout any moment, that the world would just be a safer more peaceful place and that we would treat others, other humans, other animals, our planet in ways that are more sustainable. Mm -hmm. And that just really grabbed my heart. It grabbed my heart so much that I I didn't know what to do with it. And so I still believe that today. And that's one thing. Another thing that keeps me going, we get feedback daily from members saying the whole spectrum, like you changed my life. You're a life changer. You've saved my life. You're a lifesaver. You helped me get through cancer. You mm, wow. helped me grieve from uh, the death of a loved one. You helped me uh, navigate uh, this, you know, uh, this incredibly painful autoimmune condition. I mean, I go on and on. Like my f- husband's so grateful that you that I'm no longer as reactive. Or you know, so so that. And then the third thing is as I have as as I've ex- as I've experienced. The, sh- the, sh- the shift in culture that we're referring to, I see the power in it and I see the beauty in it. And mm. I see how people, when provided with that kind of environment, again, I'm not saying we've nailed it or we're done or it's, it's all great, mm-hmm. uh, but I'm seeing the glimpses of how that provides the opportunity for others to show up as their whole selves at work and, and, and operate with each other cross-functionally in ways that are just way more healthy. Mm, yeah. And so that is massively inspiring to me. So overall mission, how we are impacting our members and how we are impacting the lives of, of each other who are behind the scenes working on our service. Like that right there is enough for, <laughs> <laughs> like, like, like I, it doesn't mean I don't wake up sometimes depressed or anxious. Uh, it's, it's common. The ups and downs are are intense at times, uh, but those are very solid reference points and, and, and anchors for me that are, are just they 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 they're, they're persistent and durable. And I'm and I'm I'm just so grateful. I have an incredibly deep amount of gratitude that I that I still get to do this. That I still get to be in this position to to operate along these dimensions that I just mentioned. Mm-hmm to keep living into this potential and exploring it with people. That's beautiful. I mean, it, it seems like when I, when I just listening to you, it's so um, it's very inspiring to me because you've through, you know, your own, your own journey managed to reach a place and create, create an, an environment, not just for yourself, but for other people to actually do exactly what you set out to do back when this whole thing started, which was, you know, to maintain and cultivate that, that faculty of wonder and to, to go on this journey. And it's funny, I want to share with you, um, 
I, I wasn't aware until I was getting ready for this conversation that Glow had a manifesto. I was wondering if you would share that with us. Mm. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, I don't have it in front of me. I have it. I, I have it. I used to have memorized. You want me to try to do it from memory? Yeah. So it is the following to you, the seeker. You listen to your inner calling to nurture wonder and curiosity, to illumine your mind, inspire your heart with kindle with, sorry, with courage to kindle the fire on a journey of self-discovery. We exist for you to awaken the desire to live your own true potential with a full throated. Yes. To show up and do the work intentions and actions define us, not outcomes alone. We empower one another to be of service to others to reveal to ourselves our most, most authentic feelings, to affirm our inner values and cultivate compassion, to create community and conversation, to give expression to our truest selves. At GLOW, we create tools and experiences that challenge you to invest in yourself, to become strong in body, engaged in heart and mind. Your yoga occurs on a mat, on a bicycle, in conversation, through any endeavor. In yoga, we accept the invitation to live fully. Join us on this journey. You know, when you say that now, what does that uh, spark for you? Well, you know, that one line actually refers back to action, not, not, not fruits of action. Oh, like, like the opportunity to, 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 to align all these different aspects of me into one thing towards which not only was I thoroughly passionate about, but that was in service of something larger than myself. That's, that's what those words encapsulate for me. No, I love that because, you know, when I, when I hear you say it, like, watching glow watching you and your journey and hearing you talk about that it just honestly gives me a lot of um inspiration and excitement and hope which is why i wanted you to come on the show because you're a living breathing example of that i can point to and i want to and i'm on a mission in my life to make more companies like this myself and to help other people do this and this is really the source of this entire show is, is like creating what i what i refer to as enlivening organizations right and those are organizations that um it's ironic that I named the show and came up with that entire concept without looking up the definition of the word enliven, which is a little bit <laughs> like what? It's very, that's very, that's very unperfectionist of you. It is right. I'm making progress. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> making progress. But it turns out, you know what the definition of enliven is, and this is why I'm so excited because you guys are doing this. Is it is to give life, action, or spirit to, to animate, and that is a uh, to me what I hear and see in what, everything you are you all are doing. So. Thank you for what you're doing and please keep it up. We're going to wrap up now, but I want to actually ask one or two quick rapid fire questions. Uh, the questions are short. Your answers don't have to be. They can go as long as you, as long as you feel. Um, so first of all, you're starting a podcast. Tell me about that. So it's going to be called Glow Together. And uh, you know, I, I haven't, I haven't uh, memorized my pitch yet. Just tell me what it means to you. Like what, 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 um, what do you want to express in the show? What do you want to explore? And, and um, yeah, what's, what's it, what's it going to be about? There will be different buckets of, of content. There will be interviews with me. There will be interviews with our faculty. There will be interviews with our members. There will be the audio from Glow Talks when we hold guests, when we, when we have guest speakers speaking at our, our office. And I think that's it. And you know, ultimately, we have a, we have a, a, a phrase that we use um, at the office, and that's... You know, take care of yourself because our world needs you. And like I, the name of the podcast will be glow together. And the way we think of, of, of those two words is like to glow together is to participate in this ongoing project of caring for ourselves together. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think there are just you know, given the fact that this decade we're just going to share so many different transitional moments. There are going to be crises and opportunities for us and for our relationships, particularly with the natural world. I think it's clear now that we've crossed a tipping point. Like I, that's no longer an arguable statement. And I, I really believe that like our future selves and future generations will ask us like, how did we contribute to meaningful change? Mm, yeah. And like, like, like truly ask like, wh like what have you cared about you know, to go back to the question that, that professor asked, like, what, what did you, what did you care about? And, uh, and what did you do about it? And that, uh, the, 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 the sort of sensibility of, of what we're doing at glow is like, like we believe we all need to engage these questions through self care. And like 
I want to continuously explore self-care as more than what typically might come to mind. Um, you know, when we deepen our understanding of the connections that we make, as we've discussed today with our inner experiences <laughs> that emerge from different sources, our biology, within our psychology, through physical movement, and how do we bring those into our outer experiences of relationships, workplace culture, and leadership? Like we, it's so clear that like our self-care, how we treat ourselves, uh, extends into our work life, our family life, our innermost experiences of self. And it's not just merely a concept that we use to explore ourselves. It's, it's truly a complexity of practices that we can do with each other mm. and by ourselves. And so, uh, I, it, it'll be fascinating to see where that, that leads, you know, like, for example, I would love to interview Amy Edmondson. That would be a dream come true, you know, for the workplace culture component. But, uh, you know, based on everything that I said, you can imagine just a pretty broad spectrum of, of, yeah. of, of people. For sure. I, know, I love that. Um, so who or what has had a major impact on the way you show up in the last few years? You know, I, the, the, the group work, I really needed the group work, the group leadership work, the forum that I was in. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I truly needed to come out of this habit of being in, in the trenches and putting out fires and thinking that I was alone mm. and being seen and to see others deeply and to, and to, to, to see their vulnerability helped crack open my own experience of what it means to, to, to be vulnerable with myself and with others. And I also did another, um, like leadership boot camp uh, with another group, and same, same, same dynamic, same experience emerged out of that. And you know, that, that I mean, I could like list so many things, but <laughs> this being kind of like a short answer format, like I would just I would leave it at that. Like just being in conversation, in connection with others, in 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 an environment and in a way of being together that allowed for disclosure and vulnerability was something that I didn't know how much I desperately needed. Mm, wow. That's huge. That's huge. And maybe it's related to that. Maybe it's not, but I'm curious if <clears throat> there's anything in recent memory, is there a small change you've made in recent memory that's had an outsized impact, whether it's, you know, on your work life or at home or, or whatever, but you know, small change, big impact. Coinciding with the challenges that we explored here together, there was a moment where I was experiencing incredibly painful back pain mm. and about six months into it, uh, not knowing what to do about it. I, I didn't, I got an MRI and it showed a herniated disc. that was bowing oh, wow. out into the spinal cord and stenosis Ouch. and, and went to three of the top surgeons in LA. They all wanted to operate. And it wasn't until I, met the right people and uh, it was a fantastic documentary called all the rage. Hmm. Uh, I was familiar with John Sarno, Dr. Don Sarno before the movie, but that movie just did it for me. Like, I, I probably was crying throughout the whole movie. It's, it's, it's powerful. And through that journey of just trying to ignore it, fight it, wish it away, be angry at myself for like, this isn't me. Like, I'm an athlete. This is like the opposite of everything that I identify with. I'm not someone who, can't walk half a block without stopping. It's just not me. I, mean, I, was, <laughs> yeah. I was racing in, in amateur races, mountain bike and, and cyclocross races. And like, it's just, I, I, I had a very strong physical uh, uh, yoga movement practice. And but so to, to experience this was just challenging on a number of fronts. And yeah, it wasn't until, and there's so many confounding variables, like what actually shifted it. It, it is hard to actually pinpoint, but I, I, I truly believe the, practice of kindness towards myself and the practice of, of listening to and feeling my, my embodiment and listening to and connecting with heart mm -hmm. is though it may not sound like a small change. It it's, it's a decision. Like I'm going to be kind to myself. Uh, the amount that that's unlocked for me is huge. That's amazing. Just in wrapping up and in closing, uh, first of all, where can people connect with you online if they you know feel compelled to to reach out? I would just glow dot com, g l o dot com. Uh, you mentioned the podcast. I, I don't know yet what the URL will be. Uh, it'll probably be glow dot com slash glow together 
possibly. Um, I'm at Derek Mills, D E R I K M I L L S, pretty much everywhere. Okay, great. We'll link to all that. And, and as soon as the podcast is out, we'll update the, uh, the links as well. So we can make sure we get the, uh, the correct link in there. And then, um, is there any asks you have of a listener, anyone listening to this? If you could make a request of them, what would you ask them? Can I just say something on a side note? Yeah, sure. I, I, I have not practiced how to communicate a lot of the things that we've, we've dis- discussed. And, and so it's, it's really kind of revealing and, and vulnerable in a way that I, I'm not used to. Well, thanks for going there and trusting me. And I definitely have never seen myself as a, as a, a teacher or a um, imparter of wisdom, you know? So like, 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 like th- this question kind of triggers that in me, right? It triggers, a, it triggers a like, like, Oh, I don't see myself as someone who has, 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 has something, something to say to leave someone with. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, just a side note. I, yeah. Um, it's it's you finding that that voice and your your self expression with your voice, I, right? I, I would say that if any of this resonated with someone who is struggling, to know that you're not alone. Hmm. Yeah, there are there are people out there going through some version of what you're going through. We all have our own experience of what it means to be an embodied human. So no experience is the same but there probably is some overlap and there probably is help and community out there. It's, it's just a matter of being open and vulnerable enough to, to seek it out and, to, and to just get through that first hurdle of, of, of fear. Hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Derek, thank you again so much for, first of all, the work you're doing and the example you're setting. And then also thank you for coming on the show and being so open and so vulnerable with what is, as as we talked about at length, very much a work in progress as, as it always will be. Uh, so I really, really appreciate it. Thank you for coming on and for, for being open to the conversation and for everything you shared with us. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure. Yeah. Absolutely, man. We'll keep it up, and uh, we'll definitely have to we'll have to have you back for a round two somewhere in the future to check in on on how things have evolved and and see where things are at that time. I would love that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I love it, man. We'll keep it up. <laughs> Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us on iTunes. That helps us reach way more people and build this community up. For show notes, links to the resources, and everything else we discussed, please go to enliven.fm. Feel free to reach out with questions, feedback, or just to say hello by emailing connect at enliven.fm. Be sure to subscribe. And until next time, my friends, leave them better than you found them. We'll see you soon.